Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text I have chosen is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And this is the theme verse for today. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Dear Christian friends, it just so happens that the text I've chosen for today is of particular interest to me because it includes the verse which my father, who was also my pastor, chose as my confirmation verse some 61 years ago. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. He died for all of those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That's how I memorized it. To my surprise and delight, it was also part of the epistle lesson for the Sunday that I preached my first sermon after my installation at Calvary Lutheran Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. Of course, I chose to preach on it that Sunday. By the way, it uh, is relegated to an alternate reading for this Sunday's epistle lesson. We read verses 1 through 10. I don't think there's a better text that, text that summarizes the purpose and goal of the Christian life. If I could put it into the form of a motto, it would be, live for him who died and rose for you. Living for Jesus is what gives meaning, purpose, and direction for our lives. It seems that there are many people who have no idea what they're living for. They live aimless lives without purpose or goal. Many such lives end in tragedy. With nothing to live for, such people gravitate toward destructive behaviors and lifestyles, destructive both to themselves and others. It probably shouldn't surprise us that so many in our society are living without purpose or goal, because we are raising a generation of young people who have little or no concept of biblical principles, who have not been taught from early on that there is a God who loves them and has a plan for their life. They can't say with confidence, I am a child of God. What's more, they've been thoroughly indoctrinated in the tenets of evolutionary dogma, which teaches that our universe sprang out of nothing, without design, intent, or purpose. We ourselves are but bits of cosmic dust, likewise the product of random, purposeless processes. Those who find such meaninglessness meaningful simply amaze me. I prefer to know that an all-powerful, all-wise God made me, loves me, and cares for me. On the other hand, there are those who have the wrong idea of what they're living for. They're living for one thing and one thing only, for self. They're living to get all they can by any means they can as quickly as they can for themselves. And they have the encouragement and endorsement of our materialistic society and its enabler, the advertising media. While Jesus teaches that a person's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, the job of the advertiser is to discredit Jesus' assertion and make him out to be a liar. We're constantly being conjoled to buy more, bigger, and better. We deserve it, they tell us. 
can't afford it, you say? Don't let that deter you. They've got a credit plan designed just for you. Designed to bury you in debt is the unspoken truth. But living for self isn't really living at all. It masquerades as life, but is in fact a form of death, spiritual death. St. Paul speaks in Ephesians of people who are dead in the trespasses and sins in which they once walked. By all outward appearance, they look very much alive. They walk and talk and think and work, eat and sleep. But it's all a caricature and a counterfeit for the real thing. They exist, but they aren't fully living as God created them to live. Living for self has a long and checkered history. Going back to the time when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, God's command in the Garden of Eden. When they chose to put their desires ahead of God's, they decided they wanted to control their own affairs, map their own destiny, <coughs> rather than let God control their lives for them. Our first parents were no longer satisfied to let God determine what was best for them. A serious miscalculation, since who knows better what's good for the creature than the Creator Himself. The results were immediate and dramatic. Adam and Eve lost the perfect fellowship with God and the harmony they enjoyed with one another and the rest of the creation. No sooner did God confront them and they both started defending their own turf, blaming others for their own fatal mistake. We heard the account of last Sunday's Old Testament lesson. Adam blamed Eve, and also God himself, who was responsible, as he reminded God, responsible for putting Eve in the garden with him. Eve, in turn, blamed the serpent. The scene is almost laughable if it weren't so tragic, and if it weren't so true to life still today. Eventually, Adam and Eve diso dis Adam and Eve's disobedience led to their physical as well as spiritual death, just as God had warned. Only God's promise of a Savior, the seed of the woman, and their faith in that promise kept them from the ultimate death, eternal death, everlasting separation from God in hell. At the time that God chose, He sent the Savior into our world. It was that very Savior, Jesus, who announced, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The very purpose for which Jesus came into this world was to rescue us from the death that we had inflicted on ourselves, from the dead end of living for self. He wanted us to have life in its fullest, truest sense, life with God, now and forever. Such life, as the Bible makes perfectly clear, is found only in connection with Jesus. As John writes in his first epistle, 1 John 5, this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Or as the familiar words of John 3.16 state, whoever believes in Him, in Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. To have the Son is the same as to believe in Him. It is to place our entire trust in Him for our salvation. It is to believe that He is the Son of God who came to deliver us from sin, death, and damnation. Jesus made that possible for us by not living for self, but living for God in every respect, in every aspect of His life. Jesus lived the perfect life of obedience, totally dedicated to doing the will of His Heavenly Father. 
That would be the life we were meant to live, but cannot. And then he surrendered himself to crucifixion and death to endure the punishment the world deserves for its sin. He died for all, Paul says in the text. Four sharp, one-syllable words, but they contain all that we need to know for our salvation. He, the one whose name was Jesus, meaning Savior, He, the eternal Son of God, begotten the Father from eternity, He who is true God and true man, He, the Christ, the promised Messiah, He died. The details of His death are recorded for us by the four evangelists. He died the most cruel, excruciating, humiliating form of death conceived in the, man, in the minds of sinful man. He died. But not even death could hold him. On the third day, he was raised to life. He died for, as our substitute. The death he died is the death we should have died. He took our place. He took our penalty. He took our punishment. In doing so, he fully met the demands of God's justice in our stead. The prophet Isaiah teaches us this vital lesson by means of pronouns. You know these words. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He died for all, the whole human race. There's no one for whom Christ didn't die. It includes all the people who have ever lived and all who shall yet live until the end of time. Don't let that fact escape you. That includes you, just as it includes me. Even though Jesus died for all, there are many people who have not accepted this message. There are many people who have foolishly rejected it. There are many people who do not believe it and therefore do not have the life and salvation which Jesus came to bring. It's only by faith that we receive these blessings. Faith that says, I'm the sinner Jesus came to save. He died for all. He died for me. Jesus is my Savior, my substitute. This is the faith which the Holy Spirit creates through baptism and the word of the gospel. This is the faith which the Spirit creates creates, having shown us first by means of the law that our lives were headed for destruction, and then having convinced us by the gospel that Jesus, and only Jesus, can save us from that destruction. By grace through faith, we are united to Christ. We receive forgiveness for our sins and power to break the hold of sin and selfishness on our lives. We who were dead spiritually are made alive in Christ. We have life with God now and the happy prospect of life with Him forever. We become what Paul calls new creations. There's a newness in all that we do. New love, new joy, new commitment, new purpose. As, now, as new creations, we are now focused on living for Him who is the source of our new life. When with the Apostle Paul we too have concluded that one has died for all, that Christ is our Savior, then we no longer live for self, but for Jesus. Living for Jesus describes the whole of Christian life. Christ is the center of our life. 
life in the home, life at work, life in the community. Our life is so totally under Christ's control that we say with the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians, for to me to live is Christ. That could be another good model to live by. Christ's love, the love he has for us, controls us. Other translations put it this way. Just think of all this variety in this one word. The love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ guides us. The love of Christ leaves us no choice. Remembering all that his love has done for us, we are moved, encouraged, and driven to live in such a way that he is honored, he is glorified, he is served. Our chief aim in life, in life is no longer to please self, but to please Christ. With the hymn writer, Isaac Watts, we declare that wonderful, that great Lenten hymn. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a tribute far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. This living for Jesus starts with trusting Him, believing in Him, and depending on Him alone for our salvation. But that's only the beginning. It becomes a way of life. It becomes a way of looking at life and at people. We look at people through Jesus' eyes, through His eyes of compassion. He saw people in their spiritual and physical needs and had compassion on them. And his compassion was always followed up with serving them. Serving them in their need. St. Paul says, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. That is, from a human or a worldly point of view. We do so from God's point of view. Our actions toward others are conditioned not by selfish and self serving worldly motives, but we are controlled by the love of Christ which moves us to love in response. And where does Jesus ask us to direct our love? Toward the neighbor who needs it. The neighbor he calls us to serve in his name. Indeed, living for Jesus becomes serving the neighbor with our good works. I don't need those good works, Jesus says. But your neighbor over there does. Let your works done in my name benefit, bless others. The love of Christ moves us to bear one another's burdens, to offer a helping hand wherever we can, to reach out in compassion, concern, and love. The love of Christ doesn't first act, what's in it for me? What can they do for me in return? The love of Christ leaves us no choice but to forgive as we have been forgiven, putting matters in the past, forgetting when someone has stepped on our pride or hurt our feelings, whether or not they apologize or ask for forgiveness. <coughs> The love of Christ leaves us no choice but to be Christ's ambassadors, as Paul says at the end of the chapter. Sharing with others the good news that Christ died for all, that he died for them too, that he has life for them too. The love of Christ compels us to support a worldwide mission effort, bringing the message of Christ crucified and risen to all nations. A special opportunity will be given us next month in connection with our Mission Sunday.